Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm super excited. So I'm David Markley. I have the pleasure of working at Algorand Inc. Uh, I, I hope I've met most of you at this point, uh, but super excited for this panel. Uh, Paul Regal really framed it up for us in the three pillars, uh, and he left a little nugget about interoperability. And uh, we are going to, well, the panel, I should say, is going to give us some insight into how Algorand thinks about this, how our ecosystem thinks about it, and the applications and the benefits to our users. Uh, but instead of hearing from me, uh, let's talk to the people that actually are uh, helping us make this a reality. And Ninos, I'd like to start with you. You and I have been talking about this chain of chains idea for a year at this point, maybe a year, year or two. Can you just help us frame it up real quick? There's L2s, there's other L1s. Like, like what is Chain of Chains, and what are you really thinking about here? Uh, OK, it's working. So I guess the main idea is it's, you know, 2021 was the year of multi-chain world, right? We've seen the rise of L1s. Now, investors are looking at the rise of L1s and saying, what's like the next iteration of that idea or that trade, right? And it's probably going to be bridges. Now the question is, how do you build a bridge so that you don't make the same mistakes you made with the L1? Now the argument for Algorand as an L1 is that it's decentralized, you know, anyone can become a participation node and validator. And what we're seeing in the bridging space is a lot of design where there's a new validator set in the middle. Um, so I think the future is one where L1s will compete as like a settlement layer, uh, where you're looking for like the most decentralized, the most secure place. Maybe performance becomes like a commodity. Things get done on an L2 and ultimately settle on chain. Uh, but if chains are going to connect, they need to do it in a way that you're not introducing new risk and like compounding L1 risk, which is where I think our grand state proofs have a real edge. And yeah, I mean, these guys are really the, like the pioneers behind that stuff. So, yeah, we, we will uh, we'll get to state proofs in just a second. But before we do, you you mentioned uh, a consideration that builders need to to take into account, and it's this idea of trust. I have a new network that I now need to entrust my assets to in order to bridge from A to B. And and so. Adi, you've done a lot of work looking at different platforms, building on different platforms. You work on Algorand, which we appreciate. Uh, can you talk to me about like that decision-making process from the, the builder side? Like, what, what are you thinking about when you think about these bridges and, and trust at that layer? OK, so, so my name is Adi Benari. I'm founder and CEO of a company called Applied Blockchain. And we've been building blockchain applications uh, since 2015. And so we started building on Ethereum. Uh, and over time, we've been building more and more on Algorand, now to the point where really a lot of the projects that we're working on are Algorand. Um, when we advise our clients, uh, and we look, we look at this, the first principle for me is to keep things simple. Right? You want applications to be simple. You want the user experience to be the best. And actually, that, that means probably using one chain. Right? That's really the ideal. Uh, and if we started on Ethereum, the reason why we couldn't stay there is because of prices and because of speed and so on. And that's really what's triggered the migration to other layer ones and to layer twos, uh, including Algorand. Um, but I still come back to keeping it simple. Right? So ideally, we would be on one chain, because having to bridge and having to, for users to move their tokens from one place to another is actually a point of friction. And, and it's, it's challenging for a user. So from my perspective, if there's a way to avoid that, all the better. Right? If Algorand ticks all the boxes, and actually I can issue my assets there, and I can sell them there, and I can trade them there, and all the liquidity is there, then why would I want to go anywhere else? All right, so over time, nobody knows how this is going to pan out. Uh, but as a techie, I like to think that, that the, tech, the tech wins. And I think Ethereum for the first few years kind of has proved that. And for me, one of the reasons why we're on Algorand now is because the tech does what it says on the tin. It works. It ticks the boxes. And it's one of the few that really does. Uh, and so that's, that, that's why we're here. I, I love the underscore and how you tied it back to the way Sean framed it up at the beginning of the day of removing friction in this exchange of value, whether it's inter-network or intra-network. Uh, and so coming around to that, Rotem, you work at Algorand specifically a, a lot on our bridging and our interoperability strategy. Can you tell us a little bit about how we think about it internally, the technology, and, and what we've done so far? Yeah, so I would say that essentially when it comes to, to bridges, I agree that like, if you can stay in one place, that's amazing. But sometimes there is like just it's unavoidable. 
And when we think about it, we think about it in one main way, is like trust. How trustless essentially the bridge can be, like what can we do in order to make sure that everything stays safe? And this is really the, the main trade-off, and this is really how I think everyone should think about it. UX can be done very much well on top of it, but really trust. And when we look at the different bridges out there, um, this is really kind of like how they mainly differ about essentially, do we have a chain of validators, or do we just, like, is it completely centralized? Which, by the way, I would say it sometimes makes sense. I mean, if you try to bridge USDC, where Circle really controls the entire thing, so it doesn't matter. Go through a centralized entity, and it's fine. But like, when, you when you're talking about decentralized um, tokens and like, really think that you want, I mean, this is why we came to blockchain after all, um, you want to make sure that this is really kind of like the main thing. And when we designed um, stage proofs, when we based it, essentially, the, it's all based on technology that we call compact certificates. It's something that came out of our research um, arm. It's uh, essentially peer-reviewed, and you can all uh, encourage you actually to read the paper. It's a great one. It really was to the point that like, you can, if you trust Algorand, you can trust state proofs. Essentially, it's as safe as using the network. You don't need to go through anyone. You don't need to trust a new set of validators. You don't need to do anything. And the beauty of that, like more than just like being safe, um, it also gives you a very nice UX that allows you to essentially communicate directly and make it almost seamless to the user in the sense of like, well, you're just sending another transaction to another chain. Got it, got it. So if I, if I could quickly uh, summarize kind of the frame up here that we've gone through, we've talked about the chain of chains, potentially Algorand being a place that can host all of your assets. However, we realize that there are other networks out there, and so we want to reduce the friction in moving assets between those networks and give the right tool set so that you don't also have to take on a credit trade or additional counterparty risk because now there's a new network or a central party. We want to make it as seamless for the builders, which, Michelle, uh, you're working on C3, which is a cross-bridge product. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're going to take these building blocks, stitch them together, and then ultimately provide value to, the, to our consumers and developers in, in Algorand. Yeah, I think you know, today, if you're looking at it, like capital markets or DeFi, the majority of the liquidity is in other ecosystems, right? Like Bitcoin has a trillion dollars in market cap, or DeFi, uh, Ethereum's DeFi has uh, 500 billion or more, right? And if, you're, if you have the best technology in Algorand, you can take the opportunity to build a, a you know, from the scratch, a pretty performant DeFi ecosystem there, um, and making sure that things like state proofs enables the user to, from, from all these other ecosystems, Bitcoin or Ethereum or other blockchains, to come and use these improved uh, DeFi platforms that are possible to be built on Algorand, right? And I think um, it's important to think us as builders in Algorand that uh, having the best technology is not enough. We also be Make, uh, because of the stage we are in today, we need to be making sure we're bridging liquidity from other places to Algorand so that people can really see the, like the, po the, the potential of Algorand as a technology. And I think that's what we're going to be able to do with C3 by early on leveraging uh, state proofs and other technologies to be able to allow MetaMask users, Solana users, and others to come and uh, achieve what they want to do on the DeFi side on top of C3. And Nino, it's kind of bringing it back to your high-level macro perspective here. As you take a view across many different blockchain platforms, you look at the different DeFi you know, consortium that are around each one. I mean, if from, in your perspective, what, what does this fundamentally mean when now we have the ability to frictionlessly move assets across chains, get them onto the right technology platform without having to have all this complicated key management or additional entities and counterparties. Like, what, what does that mean from your perspective? Well, the way I see it, state pr the arguments for state proofs are the same arguments for pure proof of stake. And state proofs are just like a gateway drug to pure proof of stake. But the, the challenge in today's market is I think decentralization is underpriced, but when things blow up, that will become very important, right? So the way I see it is we're going to see a lot of centralized bridges emerge. The market might converge on some, but as those, if those solutions uh, come under attack as value grows, then state proofs will sort of be the way the, um, like a solution for the market. Now the perfect world is they become a solution for the market even before then, right? And we don't have to. Uh, experience that kind of blow up through applications like C3. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very similar sort of landscape 
from the L1 thesis to the bridging thesis. It's the same sort of risks. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to add, we're building two pieces of infrastructure that complement this. Um, one is, is a bridge. Right? We're building a bridge between Algorand and Ethereum. Uh, and the second is we've got a, a platform called Silent Data, which enables data that outside the blockchain to be trusted in the blockchain, and specifically private and confidential data. Um, and I think it's interesting because what Silent Data does is it brings trust from outside in, and what state proofs do is they, they extend trust from inside out. And I also think state proofs uh, are a good illustration of really of what's going on in Algorand in general, right? Because if I look at the bridges that are around and they're being used for a lot of liquidity, they're not safe, right? They're not safe and they're not secure and they're not very well engineered. And people are taking risks, right? They're taking very, very big risks just to save fees and just to move things around. Uh, but the state proofs are really uh, a solid way of extending trust and building these bridges uh, securely and with the, the, the technical integrity that they need. And, and again, I think that's an example of how things work here. Also to add to that, I think one of the things people are not realizing about state proofs is that some applications such as oracles are ideal to be used on, on state proofs because if you look at other designs uh, such as like Wormhole or Chainlink where they're using a bunch of a small cohort of validators, um, if you're using state proofs, you're actually leveraging all of Algorand's security to propagate messages to other ecosystems, right? So if the price feed or data feed of whatever it is is being generated in an algorithm, uh, any other chain can actually uh, consume that uh, message pack from algorithm knowing that the entire consensus uh, w secured that message, right? Compared to 10 or 19 validators from other ecosystems. So there's, I think, going to be a lot of use cases in the future of how staples can be leveraged on top of algorithm. And I know we're throwing a lot of terminology around up here, and we can get into the weeds very quickly. So, so let me just recap and, and up-level a little bit. So state proofs is a technology that Algorand's developed that allows us to export Rotem's balance to another chain, to another application. It, it allows us to export the current state, if you will. And prove it. That's right? correct. Okay, great, great. And so, and then the other part of that is, how do you introduce this concept that, hey, there there are actually ways of doing this. Like, you could go to Circle, you could use a centralized bridge, um, but there is trade-offs there. And so, the trade-off primarily being you have to trust this entity, this centralized third party, or another validation network. Could you talk about some of the other risks in these in these other bridges? Yeah, I mean, the the bridges, the simplest bridges are. There's a piece of software that sits there. That piece of software locks tokens, or well, tokens are locked on one blockchain, and then that piece of software can mint tokens on the other. The fact that it can mint tokens on the other is a lot of power, right? And that's power that, it can, that can be abused, right? There's really nothing controlling that except the entity that's controlling that piece of software. Um, and so there's, there's really no technical security around that. Um, then what people have done to make that more secure is they've decentralized it. So you've got relayers, and you've got uh, message, effectively parties that pass messages, and take those decisions you know, in a decentralized way. So instead of just one party having that level of control, it's, it's spread across a number. That's a bit better, but I mean, they could still collude and, and off go your tokens. Uh, so the, really, the, end of this, the, the other end of the spectrum there is a trustless bridge, which is a bridge that, that where effectively the, the trust is extended all the way through, and, and the checks are made in each blockchain itself, in the contract of each blockchain. And so the, 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 the tokens are burnt on one side, and they'll only be minted on the other uh, if everything can be verified within the, the, blo the blockchain itself. And that way, you don't need to trust the, the, the party in the middle at all. Now, these are real risks, right? People are moving their tokens through, and they don't know whether they're going to appear on the other side or not. Well, imagine you had every L1 interconnecting through like 20 validators. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, you yeah. want to rely on a huge amount of people to secure value, not a small group of people. And, and to, to just expand on that, you know, it's like the implications are, if you're trying to do a million dollar trade and you want to move from one network to the other, all of the concerns, like let, let's just map it out real quick. Yeah. The uh, V1.0 bridges are these centralized parties, right? So you have to entrust Circle, Bitco, et cetera. V2.0 bridges, if you will, are this, well, let's decentralize this network, come up with a new incentive mechanism. But now, what if the trade that you're processing is more than the value that's at stake in this new network? Like The incentives are that they would just 
take your money, right? And so there becomes a, a limiter on the upside potential. And what we're effectively saying is you know, bridge 3.0, if we can coin that term here with state proofs, uh, will remove that risk altogether. And it no longer has that, those implications. Well, imagine, I'll use this analogy since I'm Australian. Imagine Australia wants to trade with America, but we have to trust, like we have to hand our money to some cent, you know, third country and if you can corrupt that third country, then you can corrupt you know, both sides of the trade. Whereas Australia just wants to trade directly with America. You know, I, as long as I trust Australia and I trust America, then we can do business. But I have to trust this new you know, international institution, um, which I think just to your point, adds new risk. I mean, it's again the very thing that blockchain was there to solve, right? Taking out the middleman. So in this case, we, we've introduced another middleman. We've got to take him out again. And so, Rotem, what does the roadmap look like? And, you know, firm dates, exact launch timing would be preferable, but, you know, we'll take r yeah, rough estimates. What, what does the timeline look like? Uh, we, we talked about how state proofs is going to be Algorand out, so exports, if you will, and have the security of data and other information out of Algorand. Adi is working on imports, so moving it from the other way in. When will we start to really see the implications of this, where we now have uh, this chain of chains, if you will, and a path towards, hey, I, I can just trust Algorands, and so long as I trust Algorands, I'm not taking any additional risk. Yeah, so I think the state is going to be out very soon. That's going to be the very first step, and essentially, immediately after, also with people like Adi, we're going to create this like direct chains, be uh, sorry, direct bridges between Ethereum and Algorand. Um, after that, essentially, what's going to happen is whether we're going to do that or people out there, it's like this is the beauty of it. It's like very pretty much an open space. Everyone is, is welcome to, to join is really to be able to come and like build light clients, which are essentially the thing that validate the other network on the Algorand um, blockchain. So essentially, if we decide to go for another chain, so once we just like build a light client within our smart con contract platform, we can create another chain. So that's really kind of like a step-by-step -step process there. And we're going to tackle it one by one, probably by TVL size, um, just to make sure that we cover it, uh, every single major blockchain out there. Um, but as I said, we're going to start with uh, the largest one that has support in, in uh, smart contract, which is Ethereum, and move um, on from their um, timeline. We're going to discuss it, but essentially beginning early next year, we're going to see the first one. And then after that, pretty much very quickly, because it's kind of like a rinse and repeat solution, which is the very nice side of it. And just to uh, refine a little bit what this means for the builders who are here, the people who are listening in, state proofs will be an open source piece of the Algorand platform, right? Yes, yeah, so state proof is completely open source. And actually, to make so state proofs, um, I talked about like the main thing was trust, but clearly, trust is um, one solid pillar. But we also wanted to make sure that this thing is going to be very cheap. Um, and fast when you go on other chains. So what um, we did, even though it's cheap, we wanted to make it cheaper. And we utilized, essentially, and empowered the ZK snark proofs to make it even cheaper. So essentially, every state proof is going to be proven um, using ZK snark, which is going to be about like very small, like 200 bytes for the developers out there, roughly, uh, that, are going to be used, that can be used like, on other chains to validate that. And essentially, once we have that, like we, we can do it very easily. And the, the really the main idea is that once we have this what I call the light client, which is essentially you can think about it as a machine that you can come to it and be like, hey, um, has this transaction happened? Hey, has this user has that and that amount of balance? Hey, um, is this state of a specific smart contract actually happened at some point in time? Uh, and the, and the co contract will basically tell you yes or no. Um, and based on that, you can really create any bridge or any kind of like um, cross-chain application or any really the limitless ideas that we can have out there with that um, will be easy. So that's kind of like the idea, just like make it very simple to developers out there to reduce it really to like a simple question that you can ask the smart contract, and that's it. And so from the practitioner side, uh, Michelle, I know you've already started thinking about this, and Adi, you're working on some of these bridges. But I'm just thinking about the opportunities. You know, could I create a bridge that uh, mints you know, wrapped tokens with a David moniker on them, right? So it would be you know, David ETH on Algorand, or I could create David BTC. Uh, th those are the types of things that this building block that we're creating at Algorand will enable the community of developers to, to start taking advantage of. It, you want to expand yeah. on maybe some of the other ways that this starts to create? Well, I, I think 
Yeah, there's two ways, right? That, like on the early stage, if you have state proofs in one blockchain like Algorand, uh, Algorand can become like an L2 for all the other chains, like the change of chains. It's an L1, but I mean uh, developers building, looking for scalability instead of going to things like Polygon or others can actually build on Algorand knowing that uh, the user experience for other users to onboard to this new layer uh, is going to be pretty seamless, right? And then you'll be able to leverage all of the technology of Algorand, which is like the, what it's most powerful for. Uh, but later on, you know, if, if more chains start realizing the power of state proofs, uh, not only on how you can like, create a, a standard for uh, like USB-C, right? Like anyone can connect to you, and, and if everyone adopts that, then you level the playing field, and everything becomes w much better to do, right? All the, to, the, to the point of w composability, having smart contracts in one place be able to um, activate something in another chain, right? Uh, and that's when really, like, that's when the user won't even care what database you're using, right? Uh, that's when like everything becomes seamless, and I think we can accomplish that with something like say, Bruce. I was going to say I, I think we have to be very careful because uh, going back to what I said at the beginning about keeping things simple, uh, we are adding. It's not just us, right? It's complexity being added here, uh, and one of the issues is how do you verify things, right? It's hard enough to actually trust things on one blockchain, right? Just think about NFTs. You know, with NFTs, you can create another NFT with exactly the same properties. Right? It'll be a different actual token, but it'll have the same properties. So how do you know which one's the original? Right? It's probably from the signature of the artist or the issuer. So just, that's a very simple example. But when you start going across bridges, that gets harder. Right? What it's, a, it's a wrapped asset. How do you know it's a wrapped of the original? How do you know the original's original? So how do you verify this stuff? Right? And if you start moving things around between different blockchains and so on, that gets harder as well. And, and again, people are not necessarily wising up to this. Right? So I think in the same way as we've got tools for creating this stuff and generating the proofs, people need to be using the, the, the tools to verify as well. Think about the scenario where, to your point, people are bridging assets you know, between chains. And then there are different bridges that are bridging between each other. And so you're going to have like risk on risk on risk. And this is where you get like the 2008 House of Cards where all of DeFi is built on you know, all these compounded risks. Whereas Algorand's approach is very simple, right? Like Michelle mentioned that the low hanging fruit is Algorand could be an L2 for people who want a fast chain, right? People who are on Polygon or Binance, they can simply use Algorand and leverage its decentralization. But then in the long term, like, do you really think institutions, governments, you know, this pool of capital that's out there will be part of a multi-chain world if that multi-chain world is governed by 19 validators, or you know, not to pick on any particular bridge, but if, if there's all this compounded risk, like it just doesn't seem plausible. So in a sense, state proofs will also massively expand the total sort of size of a multi-chain world and the capital that can take part in it. And to double click on that really quick, Adi, I know you've done a lot of uh, decision making, technical and economic decision making processes when you're working with your clients on what, what is the right technology to choose. And, and so in your opinion, let's fast forward a, a few months to when the bridge is up and everything's in place. Does it become almost a no brainer for net new developers or net new projects where, hey, we should pick chain X not to give you a leading question, and uh, because it, it has a operability, it allows us to bridge assets, and you know it, it's flexible enough, but also secure, fast, efficient, and so it gives us kind of the best of both worlds. Is that, does that start to play into your decision making at all? Yeah, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning about keeping things, things simple. So ideally, you can do everything in one place, right? But if you can't, so for example, you start creating something on Algorand, but then you have to have that bridge because you need to tap into something that's going on somewhere else, right? Whether it's a marketplace that you want people to, to be able to sell their assets at or similar liquidity. Um, so then you have to have that bridge. And then that bridge needs to be as simple as possible, as secure as possible. And, and this, this is underlying technology that allows us to do that, right? So if I, if I could paraphrase, basically, you're just going to use Algorand for the rest of forever. Is that, <laughs> is that the takeaway here? Uh, I mean, we'll just go with, uh, with, with what we feel is the best tech. And, and, and also, to be very honest, and this is what I say to all the customers, the team. All right, at the end of the day, it's the people behind it as well. So the answer is yes? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so 
Michelle, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add on top of uh, you know, some of maybe the, the bridging concepts on the NFT side. So one of the things that rattles my brain is if I've got some specific logic, let's say on Ethereum, that entitles me to a perpetual because that's becoming very trendy in NFTs these days, and all of a sudden I'm using this bridge, to Adi's point, what ensures that my logic follows, and now that I'm getting a perpetual, and that perpetual is getting bridged back. And so what, what do you think are some of the other considerations for the future? Because I think most people think we're just talking about fungible tokens, like algos and, and other, other assets. Um, but for some of these more complicated assets that you're working on, what, what are some of the things that you're thinking about for the future of these bridges? Yeah, well, I guess. Um you know, when you, you might have the creator have the asset in, in the original token, but at the end of the day, it's IOUs that you're trading uh, with each other. And I don't think that's that bad of a deal in the sense that it's very easy to track the origin of the, of the asset. So for things like collateral management, you're actually just tracking the ownership of that collateral, um, like when you're talking about finance, right? Um, so, and I don't think that bridges really complicate that, that much. Um, as long as you are able to, to track things uh, on who owns what at any given state, everything is possible, which is what the blockchain is doing. So if, the, if, the, if you're able to communicate that state to one place or the other, I don't think um, it's going to make things more troubling. I think that's an issue if, if that blockchain forks and then you actually have two versions of the original NFT by the same signer uh, in two different states. That's where, OK, I think I'm going to get worried about that. But uh, on bridging and, and tracking Tracking ownership, uh, I think it's, it's inevitable. Also, I would add that we should be a bit careful with these, um, I call it like leakage of problems. Um, when we come to solve the, bridge, the bridging between different networks, we're really talking about like creating an atomic swap or like any way to really kind of like know the state of one on the other. Um, when we try to solve problems like originality of um, NFTs and stuff like that, these are, this is kind of like a, a layer up. And I think that we should be kind of like having these things usually in a separate conversation to make sure how we utilize the thing. So it's got, the way to think about it in my mind is essentially it's like the chain of trust. So essentially every time you go and ask essentially, okay, what can I trust? There is another layer underneath it. So for example, when you talk about software, you should ask yourself, okay, wait, was the compiler okay? And if you ask what, if the compiler okay, wait, was the processor that actually created it okay? I mean, at any time in the step, someone probably could have injected something. Um, and that's why usually when we solve this thing, we just isolate it really to the bridge itself and we make sure that this is as secure as it can get. And when we go into design some applications, I guess like, as Adi would, I'm sure will do, um, on top of that, they, it's kind of like, quote unquote, almost their job to make sure that like, the originality stays and stuff like that. The bridge as a bridge really need to make sure that the transfers, that the assets were transferred properly and nothing else. So, so sort of like um, when we designed Algorand, no one was thinking about designing of bridges because this is really kind of like five levels up. To, to our commitment earlier, though, Rotem, it sounds like the answer here is just issue everything on Algorand, and then you won't need to worry about the verification of order. Oh, 100%. There, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 OK, OK. So that's how Algorand becomes the chain of chains, then. Yeah. It's, that's a big question, right? Maybe, maybe the multi-chain world is just something in the present because of how early that industry is, and like there's there's a lot of ecosystems playing out, but it might be in the future. You know, once like real money comes in, we're talking about the trillions that actually just the best tech wins, and and everyone forgets about this multi-chain uh, topic early on, which uh, it's very hard to predict at this stage. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this this chain of change. I think it's a temporary thing because it's inefficient, right? So I think over time w w things will reconcile to the most efficient place to process them, the most secure place to process them. And what, what do you think, so I, I think there are people in the crowd that would push on that hypothesis that one network will be optimized for all use cases indefinitely. And so to those naysayers who are saying that, that there's no way we're going to need bridging, each one's going to be a, its own little snowflake, and you're going to go here to do NFTs, and you're going to go here to do DeFi, and you're going to go over here to do something else. What, what do you think is needed to you know, combat that type of fragmentation? Like, what, what, is, what do you think is the defining factor of why we should all be on Algorand? And I, I'll leave, leave it open to anybody. Yeah. I, like, I still have, I, I think about this a lot, and apart from Bitcoin's use case, I, I have a hard time still trying to find out, like, why do you need different blockchains for different use cases? Like, apart from Bitcoin's unique use case, um, it's very hard for me to see 
why do you need to have trade-offs? Because at the end of the day, it's a question about trade-offs. And if you already have a solution without trade-offs, you, you should be able to do everything there. Uh, maybe it's going to be something about the applications that are built on top of it. Like, for instance, everyone's going to Terra because of Anchor, right? So Anchor is a, a super successful protocol, and, and that's the reason why you're, you want to go to Terra. But I don't know if that's going to stay like that in the long term. So it might be depending on the use cases that evolve on top. I, I would add, uh, I think blockchains also have like a cultural piece that the market could converge on inefficient technology because of the culture, right? And if you think of blockchains like countries, then you know, we look at some countries and we say, you know, their food is weird. They're, you know, I don't understand how they speak, but that's just like human nature. And it, so if, if you could see something similar to blockchains where with that said, if you have good interoperability technology, then people can stay in their country, but, but use Algorand as a settlement layer. Because we all think Algorand, you know, could be the most decentralized POS chain and sort of best settlement layer, maybe outside of Bitcoin. Um, so you want to hedge against a multi-chain world by letting people stay in their country, but somehow leverage the settlement layer of like our grand decentralization. Yeah, I'm, I'm, final, I'm, we're, we're up against time, so okay. final word. I was going to say, I'm, I'm not sure I agree, because I, I think temporarily, yes, and countries is a good example, because there's tribalism, right? But countries actually put up artificial barriers. And I think in the world of tech, efficiency wins. Right? And so ultimately, I think liquidity will flow to the most efficient place. And, and over time, there'll be consolidation and, and efficiency. And that efficient place is Algorand. So with that, the Chain of Chains panel, thank you all so much. Yeah.